He's trying to help us understand something about our relationship with him. And he wants us to get involved and engaged in this. Because I don't have all the answers, and Kevin has all the answers, and you don't have all the answers, but together we'll get a fuller picture of what is in the heart of God. Now there are many different ways of doing this, but what we've discovered is we eventually, you know, um, you talked about the 80-20 thing, yeah? In our youth ministry, the majority of young people who just came on a Sunday, not 20%, but more like 60 or 70%, got involved in going out in their community and praying for people or working in a sports team or doing all manner of different things. And here's why I think that happened. Because their perspective on God had changed. A.W. Tozer said this, Whatever drops into your mind when you think about God is singly the most important thing about you. Because whatever you think about God you will eventually be to other people. It's an interesting thought. I personally, I think that's probably right. The Pharisees thought he was a judge and they judged people. It kind of got me thinking, it's a different story, it got me thinking, well, maybe the way I treat people tells me what I really think about God and who he is. So we can't simply, I know, I know um, you've got a little phrase about this, we can't simply say to people, hey, we just need to be more missional because it starts in a heart thing. I mean, the Jehovah's Witnesses are missional, but they're doing it because they're asking this question, how far do I have to go? What do I have to do to be part of the in crowd? To earn my salvation, if you like. Um, Lastly, and I'll finish with this and then one one quick thing, is uh, what's called sued. It's spelt sod, which is odd because of the ground thing, but it's spelt sued, and it means secret. It's the inspired now, this was stolen by the Gnostics and the mystics of Jesus' time, but basically it means inspired. In other words, uh, where these three are research that leads to revelation, this is revelation that when you research it, you realize it was God speaking to you. So I'm from a, a um, my background is Pentecostal. I believe in this. I believe that God can speak to you, give you words of wisdom and knowledge and understanding he wouldn't naturally have. It happens to me fairly regularly, but sometimes God puts a thought in my mind, and then when I go and check out, I realise I'm right. I'm sure that happens with you as well. So, the question is, how do we disciple people and and help people get involved in all this and participate? How do we motivate them to do that? And that's one of the questions that we're talking about right now. We're doing it on pays, and that's kind of cool. Two things just before I finish. The first is this. The reason I'm here is because Pays is really excited about what's happening with Kevin and Anne and, the, and, and Dean and Gail and this group because I know that the ideas we've had on mission, the ideas we've had on discipleship and the ideas we've had on um, helping people study the Word of God work. I, as God's my witness, I know those three things work. My problem is I've never had a chance to see those three things work in, in the same place at the same time with the same people. And I would love, if I can help Kevin, for that to happen here. That we could see those three elements coming together. Because I think we'd have a church that looks very different from what a lot of churches do. <clears throat> and a people who would have a different level of relationship with God. You could say this. You have to read between the lines before you can live above the line. We have to begin to understand, begin to unknot some of those knots to get further along with God. I think many of us, we've been stuck for years at the same place. We're looking for answers that we're not going to get because we've not understood some stuff yet. And we've not even been trained to understand that stuff. Okay, I'm going to finish with this. And this is a question I want to leave you with. I want you to turn to the one passage in Scripture that is misleading. So there's one passage in Scripture that's really misleading. Uh, It's just really deceptive, okay? And you'll find it at the end of the Old Testament, the beginning of the New Testament. So if you want to find the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, I'll point it out to you. I can't believe it's in the Bible because it's so deceptive to most. Do you want me to show you what it is? It's this page here. I'll tell you what that... You were worried, weren't you, for a minute? Okay, I'll tell you what this page says. This page says to me, nothing happened. Four, it represents around about 400 years and it says to me, 
nothing happened. Nothing could be... The, it's the only deceptive thing in the Bible is the blank page. Because actually something very, very important, and it affects you and me, happened. Um, it was summed up by what's called the new sensitivity within Judaism. It changed... The way the Hebrews thought about God here was very different from when they thought about God here. There were some major significant changes. And, and there were three questions that were going through their mind and they were wrestling with some of them at this time. One of the questions was this. In the Old Testament, we've understood that what God is saying to us is this. If you're bad, bad things will happen to you. If you're good, good things will happen to you. But we're struggling because it doesn't seem to work out that way. Even some of our prophets say, why do you allow good people to suffer and bad people to prosper? So, so have we really understood that? And the second question is, if somebody does a, a good act in order to get a reward, were they really good in the first place? If somebody does a righteous act in order to get something, if somebody is generous because they think they're going to get given twice as much, is it really generosity in the first place? And the third question was, what's the kingdom of heaven really look like and what's it got to do with all this? Now, to their credit, they didn't think, oh, we don't understand this, so let's forget it, it doesn't work. They think, we, we're not seeing it from the right perspective, we've got to think this thing through. So by the time Jesus comes on the scene, people are really, in my, this is where I would put it, people are really itchy. You know, like, have you ever had an itch? And, you, and it's really itchy, and then somebody scratches it, and it's like, oh. I think people were really itchy, and Jesus scratched them, and some of them went, oh, okay. But have you ever had somebody scratch in the same place, and you've not been itchy? It's painful, isn't it? So Jesus comes and he goes around scratching people in the same spot and the only difference is, are they itchy or are they not itchy? When Jesus comes, some people were really itchy and it was like, oh. And some people were like, no, we're just happy with this. We're, we're happy being the boss of this. And the question I want to finish with is this, are you itchy? Because if you are, then there's an element of this where there might be, oh, of what I said, and they're older and that sort of thing. So the question is, I'd like to say is, are we itchy? And that's my little talk for you. Can we just pray? Is that okay? And ask God to help us. Uh, I know Kevin's coming up, so well, I just pray um, as Kevin and as uh, Dean and the, and the guys just share their hearts a little bit more. You would help us to uh, be itchy and um, soften in our hearts, I pray. Lord, uh, a ridiculous amount of information I've tried to squeeze in. So I pray that your Holy Spirit will give us revelation uh, and fill in the gaps of the mistakes and things I've left out and things I've overemphasized. In your name we ask it, Lord. Amen.